Good morning, good morning to everybody. I'm so glad that you're here today. Welcome to week two of this series called Grace Loves. Grace Loves. All month, uh, this is really, really cool. We are studying the love of God. We're talking about what God's love does in our lives, how you and I can experience the love of God, but then also how we can express God's love. And of course, today we honored people in the medical community. So glad uh, for all that you guys do for us. And then uh, next week, We'll be honoring educators and teachers, uh, principals, people in administration and education. So important. And so if you know somebody in that field, uh, make sure they're here next week. And then the last week of the month, uh, at the end of August, we'll be honoring first responders, police officers, and firefighters, and EMTs, and the people who come. We really need help, and we want to make sure that they're here too. And and uh, we're really taking this time to express some love and encouragement to people in our community that make our community what it is. Because one of the things that we're called to as a church is not just to uh, love each other and to be here in the church, but to be out in the community and to show that love to our community. And that's what we're about and that's what we're doing. So we're talking about uh, Grace Loves. Last week I did a message about the love of God because all of it centers there. Uh, you and I need to experience the love of God so that we can express the love of God. It's not just something that we know in our head. It's something we experience in our heart and then something that works its way out of our life uh, as we're walking our life out. And so we talked about what God's love is really about and how it changes us. And uh, we're going to need to know that today because as we take a next step in understanding the way God's love challenges us to live, uh, we're going to need the power of that love working in us. And you'll see that uh, today, you're handed a set of notes on your way in, and the title this morning is Love That Forgives, Love That Forgives, and I just want to jump right in to these notes, so uh, if you're taking notes, write this down, and if you're not taking notes, write this down. In this message, each of us, every one of us, can better walk in God's love by walking in the freedom of forgiveness, the freedom of forgiveness. I chose those words, they're very important words for where I feel like God wants us to go. When the love of God is working in my life, it empowers me to live out what he's called me to be and to do. And for the rest of these weeks of this series, we're going to look at some moments in Jesus' life for a very specific reason. Now, I want you to track with me here, and let me just set this up for all of us. First, the Bible teaches us, it says, God is love. Now, I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, God is love. Do that right now. God is love. The Bible also teaches us, very plainly, that Jesus is God. So it teaches us that God is love. It also teaches us that Jesus is God. So turn to the person on the other side of you, your second choice. Tell them, Jesus is God. Do that right now. All right, now, look right here. Here's what I want you to see. If God is love and Jesus is God... What that means is that Jesus is love. Let me say it to you again. If God is love and Jesus is God, then Jesus is love. And here's why that's important for you to know. Then everything that Jesus did, love did. If you want to see what love means in a life, all you have to do is look at the life of Jesus. Because God is love, Jesus is God, that means Jesus is love. That means Jesus is love wrapped in skin. If you want to see what it looks like to live a life of love, look at the life of Jesus. Everything that he did, love did. So we're going to look at a couple of things that he did. Some of them are pretty mind-blowing. In fact, today, the, the, you're going to see why what he did here was so life-changing and so different than what people expected of him. Jesus lived a life that was sinless, it was perfect, and it was an example of what love is all about. This message is about us finding freedom in forgiveness. And I wrote this statement, you are never more like God than when you forgive someone else. You're never more like God than when you forgive someone else. Now, I'm not here to say that that's easy. Maybe it's even better understood than it is lived out. But here's what I want you to know. When you have the love of God empowering your life, it gives you the power to do what he's called you to do. In other words, let me say it to you another way. You don't have to live the Christian life on your own power. It isn't about you and I mustering it up somehow, being strong enough. No, here's what it's about. It's about me receiving the love of God and it working in my life so much so that it gives me the power to live it out day in and day out in my life. Literally, you and I can do things that we can't do on our own, 
because we serve God and his love works through us. And so what I want you to see today is that God wants all of us, every single one of us, to live in the freeing power of forgiveness. And what I want you to do, here's what I want you to do. I don't want any person in this place to leave here today carrying the weight of unforgiveness or bitterness anymore in your life. I believe God's going to give us a moment at the end of this service where the Holy Spirit is going to help us maybe do something we never thought we could do. And I believe there are some people in this place that are going to walk out of here with a new freedom that you haven't felt in a long, long time because God wants to work in your life. So we're going to experience God's love. We're going to express God's love. And when it works in our life, we're going to live it out. So here's what I want you to do. Turn your Bible now, okay? Open your Bible, open your Bible app, and look with me at Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, I want to read to you a few verses here about Jesus at the cross. Remember, everything Jesus did, love did. So what that means is that the love of God allowed Jesus to die on a cross for you and me. In fact, this is the most incredible example of the love of God. God loved us so much that he was willing to give himself up for us, even when we were his enemies, even when we were turned away from him, even when we weren't living our life for him, he still loved us, and that example is shown on the cross. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that while you find this passage. Luke chapter 23, uh, three words you might want to just write down the side of your paper there that have to do with what was happening here at the cross. First, uh, uh, death by a cross or crucifixion was excruciating. It was very painful. In fact, it was designed to be painful. The Romans designed it, and they were experts at creating pain in someone's life. They had people whose whole lives were dedicated to figuring out how they could create the most pain without killing you. How can I hurt you the worst and still keep you alive so you can continue to be in pain? What a terrible job, but it's true. And so they devised this crucifixion, this way of taking someone's life. It was excruciating, and literally how it worked is uh, you, of course, be nailed to a cross, and just imagine that for a moment with a nail through holding both of your wrists to a cross beam, and then a nail through your feet uh, sticking you to the bottom, and, and the way it worked is every time you went to breathe, you'd have to push up on your feet, and think about that, with a nail through your feet into the beam, you'd have to push up to get a breath, and then uh, collapse back down. Every single breath was as painful as possible. And what would happen is you would suffer that way until you literally ran out of energy and couldn't push up anymore, and then you would die of asphyxiation. You'd choke to death. It was a long process, and it was painful. In fact, the word excruciating comes from the cross. Excruciating means from the cross. It, when we wanted to describe something that was incredibly painful, that you almost didn't have words to describe how much it hurt, we used the cross as that example. So it was excruciating. Second, it was expensive. This is a very expensive way to take care of somebody that was an enemy or somebody that was a problem. Why was it so expensive? It involved so much manpower and so much process to get somebody to the cross. It was not the cheap way to go. And so they spent a lot of money or manpower or energy on taking someone's life this way. And third, it was an example. The reason they crucified people and they crucified them publicly was to be an example to everybody else. They wanted you and me to say, I'm never doing what that guy did. I don't want to be naked on a cross beam right outside of town, go through all of the pain and the agony and the beating and all of that and be crucified to a cross and die that way. So they used it as a deterrent. They used it as an example. Here's Jesus dying a horrible, undeserved death. The Bible tells us that he is literally between two thieves. On one side a thief, on the other side a thief. He's being mocked. They're calling him king of the Jews. They're saying, you can save yourself if you're really God when he came to save others. He's being spit on and insulted. He'd just been beaten really to a pulp. And he didn't have to stay on the cross. Some people say, wow, man, you know, uh, we, we put him on the cross. Well, he went there for us, but uh, the reason Jesus stayed on the cross was not because of the nails. I mean, think about it logically. Three nails could not hold God down. So why is it that he stayed on the cross? How did he endure that kind of pain? What caused him to stay? He didn't stay because three nails held him there. He stayed because he chose to stay for you and me. 
At any moment, he could have said, stop, that's enough, and called a legion of angels down and cleared the place out. He was God. But he chose to stay on the cross for us. Pretty amazing, right? Yeah, it really is. What an incredible God. And so the Bible shows us the story. Luke 23, verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus could have said all kinds of things. Jesus could have stopped it all. Jesus could have done anything he wanted to there, but instead, look at what he says in verse 34. This is the next verse. These are his words. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Jesus forgives what seems to be unforgivable. He forgives sinners. He forgives thieves. He forgives, he's talking to these two guys. He's taught, but he's talking to more than that. But here's what he does. He forgives something that's unforgivable. And I want you to know that with God's help, if you feel like you're facing a situation where you've experienced something that's unforgivable, God can help you find freedom. I'm going to show you how in the rest of this message. Really, the question I want to answer in the rest of this message is this. How can you and I forgive like Jesus? Because if the love of God's going to work in our life, then Jesus is our example And that means that you and I need to learn, we need to see what the Bible teaches us about how we can forgive like Jesus. There are four steps. I'm going to share them with you now. Let's jump in. Number one, identify your them. Identify your them. Look at the words that Jesus used. Father, forgive them. And so here's very simply what I want to ask every person in this place. Who is your them? Who is it that's hurt you? Who is it that has done you wrong? I think to some degree or another, everybody here has experienced some kind of pain in life. Most of us have been wounded. Who is your them? Who is it that took advantage of you? Who is it that betrayed you? Who was a friend that didn't act like a friend? Who is it that gossiped about you? Who spread lies about you? Who said things that weren't true? Who is it that cheated you? Maybe a spouse betrayed you. Who hurt you? Maybe even abused you. What was that big one-time offense and who did it? Or maybe it's been a series of small things that have just added up and added up and added up and added up and added up over time. But here's what I want you to see. Who is your them? This is where it starts. You need to identify your them. Who is it? And for some of us, it's really easy. You know right now who them is. For others, maybe we're struggling a little bit to recall it all or to get it down or to to let the clouds part so we can figure it out. But here's what I want you to see, and this is in your notes. All unforgiveness has a name. All unforgiveness has a name. So where there's bitterness in my life, hurt in my life that way, it always has a name. And let me just give you a couple of questions to help. So if you're struggling with, I'm not sure, I don't know, I, I'm unsure, I feel like maybe I've let that go, but I don't know where I am, let me give you a couple of questions. One, is there someone whose name you react to when it comes up in conversation. You know what I mean. That person's name comes up in conversation and something inside you goes, woo! Whether you show it or not. Is there someone where uh, you find yourself happy when something goes wrong in their life? They have a problem, they stumble, they fall, something happens, some misfortune you say to yourself, well, uh, you know, that's good stuff right there. <laughs> Third question. Is there someone that maybe you even wish bad things would happen to? Maybe even at that level. All unforgiveness has a name. Who is your them? Second thing I want you to see is that all unforgiveness has a root. Has a root. R-O-O-T. Like a root. Like a root of a plant or a root of a tree. It's something that goes down into your heart. It's a root in your heart. And that root, it can be a number of things. So all unforgiveness has a name. It's attached to a person. All unforgiveness has a root. I want to show you what that could be. First of all, a root could be words. It could be something that was said about you. Maybe it wasn't said last week or last month. Maybe it was years ago, but it's stuck with you. And it's a root that has dug into your heart. A root could be actions that were done that shouldn't have been done. Maybe something happened to you, should have never happened to anybody, it happened to you, it was an action, it shouldn't have been done, that can cause a root in your life. A root could also be an action that should have been done but wasn't. 
In other words, it's not something that happened that shouldn't have happened. It's something that was supposed to happen, but it didn't. Something that should have happened, but didn't. It can be intentional. Sometimes, and I'm sorry to say, there are people in life that hurt us and they know they're hurting us when they do it. It can be intentional. But a root can also be unintentional. There are times where you can be hurt or you can even hurt someone else and you didn't mean to and didn't even know you did it. It can be unintentional. Here's what I want to tell you. Pain creates emotionally charged messages that are stored in the computer of your mind. They can be old. They can last a long time. I was thinking about that and I was writing this message on my laptop computer and I wanted to see, I just out of a kind of whim, I thought, I wonder what the oldest file on this computer is. So I went and I looked it up and I pulled it up and I, I sorted it by the date and the oldest file that I had on the computer I was using was from 1995. Can you believe that? 1995. That was before Andre and I were married, 1995. 1995, there's some people in the room that weren't even born in 1995. It was a little document of a message that I wrote about how we make our choices, but that's not what's really important. Here's what I want you to see. I clicked on it and it came up and it was exactly the way that I had left it. Every word was still on the page. It was still exactly like I had written it. It had been saved all this time, stored in the memory of my computer. I pulled it up and it was still the exact same way. Here's what I want you to see. Your brain is a more powerful computer than a laptop. It has the ability not only to store information, it also stores emotional response. So your brain takes information plus emotional response and stores it the way a laptop does. You can have something that happened to you 24 years ago, the day that I wrote that document, and it was stored in your mind, not just as information, but an emotional event in your life, and it was saved right there. It can be saved in your life for 24 years and right now, even in this moment, somebody in this room can pull that back up the same way you pull up a document on a computer. When you experience pain, it causes it to be saved on the hard drive of your mind. You say, well, what do you do with that? Emotional pain can only be healed one way. Emotional pain is healed in the presence of God. I want you to hear me say that again. Listen to me, everybody. Emotional pain is not healed over time. Sometimes time actually makes it worse. It doesn't mean it doesn't get duller, maybe so. Maybe you have more documents on the computer and it's tougher to find, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Emotional pain does not get healed over time. Emotional pain gets healed in the presence of God. That's why you need Jesus in your life, because it's in his presence that the healing can begin to start in your heart. You have to begin, though, by identifying your them. This has to do with walking in love. I'm talking about how we walk this out in our life. Identify your them. Number two, in your notes, pray for your them. Pray for your them. You say, I do not want to pray for my them. I know. Nobody wants to pray for your them. But the Bible says pray for your them. Look at what it says. It's Luke 6, 28. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Boy, wouldn't it be a lot easier if it said, bless those who bless you. Pray for those who celebrate you. But it doesn't. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Matthew 5, 43, 44, 45. You've heard it was said. These are Jesus' words. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. In fact, Jesus did this. We are, well, in the passage in Luke we read, we are looking at a prayer Jesus prayed. Father, forgive them. That's a prayer. What's he doing? He's praying for those that are hurting him in that moment. It's an example to us, and the Bible goes on to teach us that we need to do this. Pray for your them. So uh, let me just express it this way. Pray for. That means do not curse them. Do not talk behind their back. Do not get back at them. Do not criticize them. Do not demand repayment from them. Now, this is a mind-blowing teaching from Jesus, and let me tell you why. Number one, some people listening to him were Romans. Here's the thing. In the Roman culture, they celebrated revenge. One of the best things that you could ever do is get revenge on an enemy. I mean, it was up there. It was like, that's like awesome. It's like incredible for them to get revenge. Who wouldn't want to get revenge? And if you get revenge, you just even it out. It makes it so good. Their whole culture was built on that. And here comes Jesus and he says, 
Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who hurt you. And then you had the Jews, religious Jews. Now they had been taught since they were young from the scripture that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Blood for blood. Somebody hurts you, you hurt them. Somebody steals your donkey, you steal their donkey. Make it even. Right? That's Old Testament right there. And here comes Jesus and he says, you have been taught an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I'm sure that they were sitting on the edge of the seat going, yeah, tell them, let's go get them. And Jesus said, but I tell you, pray for those who hurt you. Wow, it's mind-blowing for them to understand that Jesus is saying you're actually supposed to pray for people who hurt you. I'm not saying this is easy. I'm going to tell you in my own life, I have observed that this is a, uh, it's a process. It really is. When I first gave my life to Christ and I was a teenager, I had actually accumulated a, a, a big box of hurt. A lot of uh, painful things had happened in my life and there were a number of people that I had to walk through the process of forgiving with. And when I was first taught that the Bible says this about our life, that you and I are supposed to pray for those who hurt us, I, I mean, that was really uncomfortable for me. In fact, I just tried to do it. I didn't feel like doing it, but I just tried to do it because it was what the Bible said to do. And so I just started out with, you know, it says to bless them, so it's bless them, God. Bless them with incurable hemorrhoids now. <laughs> what can I say? I have a gift of creativity. What do you want from me? Here's my point. As I continue, and that was it. As I continue to pray, that turned into, you know, bless them. As I continue to pray, my heart softened. That turned into, Lord, I, I really, this is strange. I, Bless their life. Touch them, change them. If they don't know you, send somebody in their path to show them who you are. To the place where I could genuinely pray for people who hurt me. God, if you could save them, if you could work in their life, do it, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Now, it was a process for me. It wasn't great at the beginning. You noticed that, didn't you? But here's the thing. Our God is okay with imperfect progress wasn't perfect from the start, but I just hung in there and kept obeying what he said. And here's what I found out, and this is in your notes, that my prayers for others may or may not change them. My prayers for others may or may not change them, but they will always change me. They'll always change me. This is why the Bible teaches you and me that we pray for those who hurt us. And that's the second step. It's what Jesus did. He prayed for them. And that's what you and I need to do. So identify your them, pray for your them. This is about walking in love. Number three, number three, forgive your them. Thanks a lot, Garrett. Praying for them is hard enough. Now you want me to forgive them. Yes, that is what the Bible says. In fact, don't believe me? Look at this scripture, Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. And then look at what it says. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, here's what I want to see today. All across this room, I just want to do a show of hands. How many people in this room, you have experienced Jesus forgiving you for something Raise your hand if that's you. Raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. If God's forgiven you, raise your hand. Look around this room, there's a lot of hands up. So have I. How many of you have experienced God forgiving you for more than one thing? Raise two hands. All right, raise two hands, raise two hands. Yeah, some people, you have your foot up too. I see that, yeah, it's good. Now, here's what I want you to consider. How did he forgive you? Like, what was that like? Did you have to beg and grovel for God to forgive you? Did you have to deserve it for God to forgive you? Did you have to earn it for God to forgive you? Well, no. You didn't have to beg and grovel. All you did was come to him. Did you have to deserve it? No, because you didn't deserve it. Did you have to earn it? There's nothing you could do to earn it. But Jesus, because he is so gracious because he is such an amazing savior, because his love for us is so great, 
because we belong to him. Even if we mess up a hundred times, if we'll come to him with a genuine heart, he forgives us. And the Bible says this, you and I are taught to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. It goes a little deeper. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Very simply, what Jesus is saying here is this is very serious. This is very important. This really matters. This is something you need to pay attention to. This isn't something you just slough off or leave for later or just say, one day I'll get to that. This needs to be something that you understand. And here's what Jesus knows and what he's trying to tell you and me. That if you're going to live in the freedom I have for you, you cannot afford to take grudges with you. Because grudges are radioactive. Remember this symbol? I don't know if anybody remembers this. I'd be interested to know in this service if anybody remembers this. When I was a kid, I remember us doing nuclear fallout drills in school. Did anybody else remember that? Raise your hand. Okay, these are all the old people. That's awesome, and I'm with you. I'm with you. We'd be sitting in school, and a siren would go off, and literally you would get, I mean, some people are like, this is crazy, you can't believe it. But yeah, you would get under your desk, crouch down under your desk, and you take a book and put it over your head. Because if a nuclear bomb went off, that would help. Strong. It's a strong plan, I know. Well, what they're worried about is this, radioactivity. Radioactivity um, can kill you if you're exposed to it enough. And so I just did a little bit of research. I'll just share it with you. Uh, radioactive substances, the closer you are to them, the more damage they do. And the problem with them is this, that they damage your body by destroying your internal cells. They literally kill you from the inside out. Radioactivity affects you on the inside and it kills you from the inside out. So much so that it will attack and destroy your blood cells so there are no nutrients going to the rest of your cells and that exterminates your life. So when I say to you that grudges are radioactive, this is exactly what I mean. Because the closer you are, the more damage they do to you. Because the, they hurt you from the inside out. It's one thing to have a scar on the outside of your body, but many people in this room, you don't have a scar on the outside, but you have deep scars on the inside. Why? Because that grudge has been working on you and working on you and working on you and working on you. You are in a radioactive environment and you don't even know it. It's killing you from the inside out. It stops you from being able to get healthy things into your system. A grudge will attempt to block God's word from renewing you from the inside out. It's radioactive. So you and I have to move beyond that and understand the power of forgiveness. Because, and here's what I know, and I put this in your notes. Forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. Many people say, well, you know, I'll deal with that. I'm going to deal with that. I'll forgive them when I feel like it. I just don't feel like it. When I feel like it, I'll do it. I got news for you. You're never going to feel like it. Hi, I'm Garrett. I'm here to help you right now. You're not going to feel like it. And by the way, you're in pretty good company because look at Jesus on the cross. When he prays this prayer and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Let's stop for a minute and let's just plug into this question. What was he feeling at that moment? Did he feel like it? Here's what the Bible tells us. If you just back up a couple pages, you know that in the Garden of Gethsemane, the stress and agony was so great that the capillaries in the skin of his forehead burst and he was bleeding. It was like he was sweating blood. Does that sound like he was feeling gushy, everybody? Then the Romans take him and beat him to a pulp, almost to death. Then they take him and parade him out in front of everyone, naked, hang him on a cross. He's hanging there on a cross. Do you think that he was feeling warm and fuzzy? No. He was feeling agony and not just the agony of the physical pain he was under because you see, he was about to be separated from his father for the first time. He was going to be all alone. Also, the Bible says that he was carrying the weight, all the accumulated weight of the sin of the world on his shoulders. 
Do you think he was feeling warm and fuzzy? No way. I'm really glad, and you should be too, that Jesus did not make his decision based on a feeling in that moment. He made it based on a commitment to his Father. And that's why you and I are here, forgiven by God, able to be free, because he didn't listen to his feelings. Now, I'm not here to tell you you don't have them. You have feelings. They're legitimate. I'm just saying, forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. And if you're waiting for a feeling, you'll never forgive. And if you never forgive, you'll never be free. And if you're never free, you'll never walk in what God has for you. And it will be because you held on to a radioactive grudge in your life. Forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. So we're going to identify your them, pray for your them, forgive your them. And then number four, last one, leave it with God. Leave it with God. Literally, Jesus did these steps on the cross. He identified them. He prayed for them. He forgave them. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. A few verses later, he makes this statement. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. What's he saying in that moment? Here's what he's saying. God, I leave it all with you. I leave it all with you. I leave it all with you. I completely surrender everything I am to you. Leave it with God. This is the fourth step. Jesus did it, and with his help, you can too. You can leave it all with God. You can completely put the Father in control of the results, the steps, the consequences. You can leave it with God. And here's what I know about forgiveness, and this is in your notes, that forgiveness is a one-time choice. It really is. And if you've never forgiven uh, something today, now's the time for a one-time choice. You need to make that decision. But it is also a daily choice. Sometimes you got to get up in the morning and walk in that forgiveness again today. It is a one-time choice. It's a daily choice. Forgiveness is a decision, but it's also a pattern of life. It's something that we put on today, and tomorrow we put it on for tomorrow, and the next day we put it on for that day. That's what it means to leave it with God. I talked to you about uh, having a big box of hurt in my life when I first became a Christian. And so I just thought about that, and I thought about talking about that with you this way. And when it comes to the idea of leaving it with God, this is what I think about. I mean, if you could take the hurts in your life and put them in a box, you could do that. And you could have them, and maybe this box would have words in it, and it would have, this would have files in it. Maybe it would have uh, actions that were taken against you. Maybe there were things that should have been done that weren't done. If you piled up all your hurt, put it in a box, and you labeled it like I did this, this is my hurts. And we know that the Bible teaches us we're supposed to bring that to the cross. We're supposed to leave that with God. And so I'm coming to, I'm coming to you, Lord, and, and I'm, bringing, I'm, I'm bringing my box. I've got my box here. It's all, it's all here. I'm used to carrying this around. I've been carrying it for a while. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this down. I'm going to leave this with you. Here it is right here. Here's the box. There it is. I'm going to leave that with you. God, hold on just a minute. Um, I want to ask you a question. Do you see my box? I know I set it down 31 seconds ago, but I noticed you haven't done anything yet. Do you need some suggestions? Because I've got some suggestions about what to do with this box. Leave it with you. Okay. Got it. I'm leaving it with you. God, my box right here, I don't know if you, because you're busy, I'm not sure that you've appropriately taken into account everything that I have here. And, and acted on it. I was expecting you to do something immediately when I laid it down for you. And, you know, I've noticed that you haven't done anything yet. And I don't understand why you haven't done anything yet. Maybe, maybe it is that you've got too much going on. So tell you what I'm going to do. And this is what we do. I'm going to go ahead and pick it back up. And I'm going to take it with me. This is how you end up with the kind of luggage that Rachel talked about a few weeks ago. I'm carrying hurts with me from 24 years ago. 
and 12 years ago and 10 years ago and last week. I've accumulated them all. And the problem is, as long as I'm holding this, my hands are tied and I can't receive anything from him because I'm, holding, I'm too busy holding it. Why does God want me to set it down? So that my hands can be open so I can receive what he has for me. Could it be that the reason you can't receive what God has for you is that your hands are full of hurt? God never designed you to carry this. You're not made to carry it. You don't have to carry it. He wants you to lay it down. And here's what I want to say to everybody in this place. Laying it down does not mean that you're saying that what happened to you is okay. It doesn't mean that you're right with it. It doesn't mean that it was good. It doesn't mean that you say, I really want that to happen again. Laying it down simply means this. God, you are the judge. I'm not going to be the judge anymore. God, you are in charge of making sure that every wrong gets made right. And here's what I know about our Savior. Here's what the Bible says. That on the day that all history is wrapped up, any wrongs that haven't been made right will be made right by Him. And He is the perfect judge. I can trust Him with everything. In other words, you can leave it with God. It might be hard. You might be tempted to pick it back up. You might be frustrated because you don't think God's doing with it what you want Him to do. But here's what I'm telling you today. Listen to me. Leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there with Him. Leave it there with him because you can trust him. And here's why. Because God's best is always your best. God's best is always, always, always your best. It's your best. This may seem tough, but let me just say it to you another way. When it comes to forgiving and letting go and leaving it with God, here's what I've learned. And maybe this is a word for someone here. Because there's somebody here, you've been real frustrated. You've been upset with God because you don't like how he has handled or not handled whatever it is that you have in the box right there. And here's what I want to say to you. That God does not owe you an explanation or a status report for what he does with something you've surrendered to him. When I give it up, and when I let it go, it's in his hands. And everybody, listen to me. Listen to me. That's the best place for it to be. That's the best place for it to be. Because now my hands are free to receive what he has for me. And here's what I know. He doesn't have a box of hurt to give me. He's got a blessing to give me. You can receive that if you lay it down and lift your hands up to God and let him bless your life. Love, love that forgives. So this morning, I want you to bow your heads all across the room. Would you do that, please? I shared with you today about the love of God and the forgiveness of God and how that works in our lives. I talked to you today about just some simple biblical steps, good wisdom for you and I. Identify your them. Pray for your them, forgive your them, and then leave it with God. And it may be that's what you need to do today. Perhaps you're here and you've, you're carrying some pain and hurt. You have a box of hurt. Maybe your box is bigger than somebody else's. It has different stuff in it. All of us have a box. Maybe yours is bigger. Maybe yours has different stuff. But here's what I know. You can leave it with God. You can walk through these steps. Most people by now have already identified them, whoever it was, whoever it was that hurt you. In just a little bit, I want to pray with people who need to open their heart to the love of God for the first time. But before I do that, before we have that moment, I want us to respond to what we've just been taught about God's forgiveness and about it working in and through us. If you're here today and there's someone you need to forgive, again, I didn't say that you're admitting that what they did was right. I'm just saying you don't want it to control you. You realize today that you have something in your life that's radioactive. It's been hurting you. It's time for you to be free. I want to pray for you. If that's where you are today, I'm going to ask you to respond. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to walk forward. But I am going to ask you to lift your hand in just a moment. And I'm going to pray for you. But like everybody's heads bowed, please. You'd say, Pastor, pray for me. You need God's help. You want to look to God for help to forgive. I'm going to pray for you that way. 
If you want that today, all I want you to do is, in a moment, slip your hand up, and then you can slip it back down. You don't have to hold it up, but you can slip, put it all the way up, take it back down. If you want to be on that prayer, go ahead and do that right now. We're just having, just This is response time. Go ahead and lift your hand, put it back down. Many people across the room, you still need to do that? Go ahead and respond. Lift your hand, put it back down. Holy Spirit, today, I pray that you would help us. It really is the power of your love in us that gives us the strength to obey you, even when it's hard. So I pray right now that you would help us to come to a place of prayer and a place of forgiveness and a place of leaving it with you. God, I know you want us to be free and walk in the freedom of forgiveness. And where that's hard for us and where it's a challenge and where there are people here who are dealing with deep-seated hurt, I pray right now and I speak freedom over this room in the name of Jesus. That bitterness and offense and grudges will not hold us back from being the men and women you've called us to be. We're going to be people who walk in love, who experience the love of God and express it in our lives, in our community, in our city. Clean out hearts in this place, God. feel like God's doing a work even right now in your heart. You can sense that he's working in you. You've already made the decision. You've made the one-time choice. Now you've got to make it a daily practice. You walk it out day after day after day. Walk in the freedom that God is giving you right now. And this morning before we sing a chorus, if you're here today and you need to open your heart to the love of God, you know if you have a real authentic relationship with God, that's where all this starts. If you've been dealing with deep bitterness and hurt, you can't let it go until you have a relationship with Jesus. If you need to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to pray for you. Again, I'm going to ask you to respond. I'm going to ask you to do the same, respond the same way. I don't want you to stand. I want you to walk forward today. I just want you to lift your hand and say, I'm in on that prayer. If you need to open your heart to the love of God today, I want to pray with you. Lift your hand right now. One, two, three, go. Lift your hand and hold it up. You need to be in on that prayer, and you can put your hands down. Thanks. All across the room. There's people everywhere. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else? You can lift your hand. Thank you. Put it right back down. You need to come to a relationship with God. Thanks. I saw that. Thank you. Anybody else? Thanks, thanks, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me lead you in prayer right there at your seat. Dear Jesus, I come to you. And I believe that you died on the cross for me. I ask you right now to forgive me of my mistakes and mess ups. The Bible calls those sin and make me new from the inside out. I receive your forgiveness for me today. Thank you today that I don't have to beg or grovel or deserve it, but you give it freely. Forgive me and make me new from the inside out. Thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you for being a God that loves me so much. You come on your own and give your life for me. Now help me to walk with you from today until the day I see you face to face. I give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want everybody to stand to your feet right there at your seat today. We're gonna close this time of learning God's word and of being together with a song. We're gonna worship together. And so I want you to lift these words up and I want you to worship Jesus. Because you know what? Some of you are worshiping him with a freedom you haven't had in a long time. Others of you, you're worshiping him because you just met him for the first time a few moments ago. But being in his presence is what heals our heart of emotional pain. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. And then when we're done singing and worshiping God, you'll get some instructions about next steps for all of us.
and then we'll go about our day. But let's take this time, let's take this moment to sing with the team and to worship him. Would you just lift your hands? Lord, we come before you now in your presence. We worship and honor your name. We lift our hearts to you. Change us now from the inside out. In Jesus' name.